Good morning, everyone. I loved how when Pastor Van said, what do you say? He just kind of paused. Everybody's like, yeah, I think I want to take the next step, too. You know, uh, so glad to have you guys here. Listen, you guys are in for a special treat today. Um, I've got someone who's not only a good friend of mine, but also someone who's an amazing pastor, leader, speaker, teacher. Um, but he's going to be sharing with us all the way from Corvallis, Oregon. Yeah, Let me ask you, how many of you guys have ever been to Oregon before? Yes, sir. All right, we got a, we got a few people. Corvallis, Oregon. Two. All right, we got three people in the house. Um, but let me just tell you, there's some great things happening. He pastors a church. If you're ever in the area, it's called Grace City Church. And uh, I'm so delighted to have him come here with us today. Uh, he brought some of the, uh, the wonderful weather with him from uh, Oregon here today. And uh, let me just say just a few things about him. There's more to him than I have time to say, but there are a few things that you should know about him. We uh, serve together uh, as faculty at Every Nation Seminary. And uh, I've had the privilege of being able to hear some of his teachings. He teaches on biblical theology. And so uh, his class, one of our residencies, was right after our class finished. And so I had to stay after. And I was a little bit jealous of the students that got a chance to he hear what he was teaching. But uh, also, we have, uh, we've actually been uh, overseas together a little bit uh, in Cuba in a hot room teaching uh, pastors um, from sun pretty much all day for a couple of days straight. Um, from Genesis to Revelation, and uh, that is actually no joke, really went from Genesis to Revelation uh, over those couple of days, and it was just powerful. So, um, so much I can say about him. He just finished his uh, doctorate study, so this is not only Pastor Seth, but also Dr. Seth Trimmer, um, and uh, I am so delighted. So can we give a warm Ohio welcome to my good friend, Seth Trimmer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to you guys. It is really fun to be here with you. Um, I bring you greetings for all your uh, brothers and sisters out in the Pacific Northwest, and I want to extend my heartfelt thank you for the weather that uh, welcomed me to your city. I feel seen. I feel uh, all of my hydration issues that I were having has now been solved, so it feels great. And um, yes, so Oregon, it's a lovely place for all of you that uh, have not yet visited. We would love to have you anytime. Uh, home of Nike, so you can come stock up on your swooshes if you need to do that. You can do that. Um, also, lots of weird white people. We've got plenty of those too. So whatever you're into, really, uh, you can trees and mountains and oceans and all those things are there as well. Um, it's always fun for me getting to... Um, travel and to be with some of our every nation uh, churches around the world to get to do that from time to time uh, but this one has been marked on my calendar for a long time because I love your pastor so much uh, you guys are truly truly blessed to have pastor Brian Taylor here um, and normally like I wait to make sure that the check clears before um, I don't, uh, I don't have to lie here even, even a little bit. And in fact, of all the, the churches and leaders we have in every nation, uh, Pastor Brian is one of the few that I myself would just love to be able to worship with my, with my family if we happen to live in Cincinnati. So if you're in this church or if you're just even a new guest in this church, like you, you struck gold. This is just an amazing place and it's been amazing even just to be able to be with you and worship with you even for this uh, brief time. As Pastor Brian mentioned, we had a special time together in Cuba teaching some of the underground pastors uh, there. Uh, uh, in that nation, and uh, my goodness, we are our final night in Cuba. This is how I knew, like, we were going to be bonded for life. Our final night in Cuba, we were just hanging out with some of the other uh, pastors and, and uh, those who went on the mission trip there. And it's, it was getting late, maybe around uh, like 10 or 11 o'clock at night in Cuba, and it's still 95 degrees and 95% humidity. And of course, we were in this small, tiny room trying to be inconspicuous, you know, with the government and so forth there. Uh, but they asked us to wear pants in order to be respectful. And I, I don't, uh, oof, that was tough. Uh, but uh, anyway, 10 and 11 o'clock at night, all of a sudden we hear this loud bang go off, and it turns out a transformer blew. So all the power, which meant all of the AC, went out of the house uh, that we were in. And we are in this concrete little building. If you know anything about the upstairs of a concrete building, it just retains all the heat in it. 
And so we were just sweltering. And I'm not sure why. There were several rooms upstairs that were unoccupied, but we decided that misery loves company. And so Pastor Brian and I were just smushed together in this small room. And uh, I've never seen a man smile so much through so much torment. So I just realized <laughs> this is the man that you want to be in the foxhole with. This is the guy for sure. Uh, but fortunately, we survived that, and we get to be here. I, uh, so uh, Friday was actually the day of my commencement where I graduated my degree, and I had planned for a long time that after I graduated that, uh, A, I was going to enter into ac Academics Anonymous because I've had a problem with too many uh, degrees, and so this is the last one. My wife has assured me that this is going to be our last one, so this is the last one. I'm um, graduating 23rd grade. Thank you very much. Uh, so <laughs> And, um, but I was planning to decompress and take a, some time uh, over the next week just to, to pray and to kind of get my head above the clouds a little bit and to see Jesus and be with Jesus. And so I've had a little road trip and some time. And, uh, and I was thinking to myself, where, where, would be, where would be the most awesome place to like really cap, put a capstone on this time with Jesus before I fly back home? And it just occurred, Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where you would go. That's where you would be. That's where you would go. So... It just, uh, there's no other right answer to that question, I don't think. So that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here to be with you guys, and it's going to be really fun to do so. I'm, so um, I don't know what the last three years have been like for you, but for some, it's had some challenges. Un poquito? <laughs> just <that> like, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Of a, of a large number of variety. You know, it's one thing to deal with a tsunami of ethnic tension or political tension or economic recession or, uh, or I, I, apparently there was some virus that was kind of going around for a little while. I'm not sure about all that, but it's, it's one thing to deal with just one of those issues, as it were, but to have to deal with them um, at the same time. It's quite a bit. And... I look back on that season now, especially stepping into 2023, and if I'm being honest looking back in hindsight, I don't think I can minimize any of those categories and any, or any other of the categories that I'm, I'm failing to, to mention here this morning. But I look back in hindsight and realize there was something um, less spoken of, but possibly more prevalent and long-term, potentially even more uh, damaging and toxic that I'm seeing even my people even now continuing to deal with. And that has been an utter pandemic of anxiety. And it's been the thing underneath the thing that has made all of the things that much worse. And there has rarely been a moment or a conversation that has not either been about directly or indirectly mental, emotional health, anxiety, or depression, loneliness, isolation, like so on and so forth. There's rarely been a moment, any time in a sermon, where I don't mention anxiety, where it's like everyone who's falling asleep now quickly becomes awake and starts paying attention as if this is now relevant to me. Or even just the prayer requests that you get in, like in a, it seems to be largely centered around that. And there's good reason for it. My uh, degree that I did, my doctoral uh, dissertation, was on the infusion of theology and psychology, specifically looking around the issue of anxiety. And it turns out that anxiety is every bit as contagious as any virus known to man, and possibly more so. And that is not just uh, acquired by individuals, but it, it breeds in groups. And that anxious environments tend to breed greater anxiety among people, and greater anxiety among people tend to breed more anxious environments. And all the research is just clarifying with all of us probably already know intuitively that even among younger generations, they are the most anxious generation that we have in modern history. Even though we're living in the most comfortable and prosperous civilization that has ever existed in human history, Yet we are seeing the younger generations be simultaneously the most anxious. So put that into your formula and figure that one out for me. It seems as if no matter how much progress or innovation or technology or whatever it is we're able to add into our lives to provide convenience or comfort or possibility, it's not seeming to solve the deeper longings of our hearts. We can prime about anything to our doors in 24 hours. We can death scroll Netflix, which is all the, I don't even watch anything on Netflix anymore. I just scroll the options for three hours before I go to bed. <laughs> like, I don't know. If I, so that's, 
slightly indecisive, uh, but it sure seems as if this has really got the grip of, uh, of our modern world. Studies are showing that among Gen Z, that the average anxiety a level among a teenager or early, someone in their early 20s is the same as it was among psychiatric patients in the 1950s. And the longing for many people is to find some sort of solution, to find something that will help. And what we are getting increasingly better at and just doubling down on every single day as far as I can tell is therapy and medication and listening, affirmation. And it's as if we are trying everything we know and using the best of all that we can come up with to try to meet these needs, but they're not getting better. And I'm not saying that as someone who doesn't believe in therapy or medication or like even more listening or like these are all very, very good and helpful things. All the little tips and tricks of mental and emotional health and uh, like dietary and getting good stuff, all of that is I'm all for it and is a good thing but it's not sufficient to save us. And there seems to be something that is yet lacking, a piece that is just, it's almost as if a rainbow we're chasing off in the distance that keeps running away from us. And even at times, it becomes almost the, um, sometimes the motivation or the temptation to even like come into church spaces or Jesus spaces and to be seeking Jesus for some sort of relief in our internal lives. Wanting to have clarity in the fogginess of our identity or relief in the depression or loneliness or that we might be feeling. And all of that is not wrong. But there is something that seems to be happening here in 2023 that's not that, like, pretty much your neck of the woods here, where God seems to be responding to this particular moment in time with a special outpouring of his presence where God's solution to the anxiety of the world is not another trick or tip, but it's him. And it's not just the gifts of God he is pouring out. It's his presence he seems to be pouring out. I'm sure some of you are aware of what's happened not far from you at Asbury University, but that has been leaking. And there's stories of all kinds of things happening, not just around the country, but around the world, but even in Corvallis, Oregon, many of our students picked up on this deep longing for God, hunger for God, realizing that nothing else in this world seems to be satisfying the deep needs and cravings that they're having in their soul. And no no matter how much of the world they're able to possess, it seems as if their soul is still lagging behind. So our students started gathering together and worshiping for three, four hours at a time on end with no agenda and nothing organized and everything as far as production value, extremely mediocre and but just sitting in God's presence and just absorbing the reality that where two or three are gathered, Jesus promised that he would be there, and indeed that is still the case. And I'm watching God do something special in this moment and season, and everything in me just wants to cooperate with it, to ride the wave of it, and to not resist it. And I want to see God come and visit not just his people, but make himself known to so many people who are searching everywhere in the world for all the right things in all the wrong places. But part of the frustration of this moment is realizing that God tends to come where he's wanted. And God's presence is the thing that our hearts were made for. It's the reality that you were made by God and for God and anything else you try to shove into your heart to satisfy your life will ultimately leave you empty. And unless and until it is God that fills you and walks with you, you will find yourself endlessly trying all types of different hacks and solutions. But it's only Jesus himself that is meant to satisfy us. And when we find that we find what the Bible calls salvation. When we actually surrender to that, that's where the good stuff starts happening. But there's a a purity of this moment. There's a purity of what God desires to do, of pouring out his presence that can quickly be substituted. The desiring God for God is a beautiful picture, not just of what 
God desires to see happening, but what God is actually doing right now, pouring himself out. But there's a subtle way that our hearts can um, become misaligned with the purity of desiring God for God, and that's just simply beginning to desire God for something. Where instead of wanting God for God, because God is sufficient, because God is enough, because God is the gift, we can subtly in our hearts just say, well, it's not like I don't love God, but I just want, I need God to do something. I need direction, or I need peace, or I need money, or I need this relationship to be solved, or I need my kids to be fixed. And I, like, I, I need my spouse to be upgraded, honestly. And like, or whatever you like, I just, I am seeking, I am desiring God for something. And the fuzzy little gray space that exists within is it's, it's not as if the Bible doesn't make very clear that God is generous and outpouring, that he invites us to bring our needs and requests to him, to ask, seek, and knock perpetually before him because he desires to give good gifts to his kids. Like, this is a thing with God. However, there's an easy way in which our hearts can mix up the gift for the giver. Where we don't just love God for God, but we're loving God for the things that God gives. And so even in this moment, it's easy to say like, well, I'm seeking God for peace, or I'm just seeking God for, you fill in your blank. And miss the reality that the true gift is Him. In Acts chapter 2, when the church has its birthday and the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter preaches a sermon to this crowd filled with people from every nation. At the end of it, he gives the invitation saying, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not receive all the things that God wants to give to you. You will receive God himself. God is the gift. God is the thing. His relational presence living not just with you, but in you, that is, that's it. That is the treasure buried in the field. That is the pearl of great price. That is the thing that our hearts were actually made for. And everything else, my friends, is frosting on the cake. And if we're not careful, we'll not just slide from simply desiring God for something, but actually slip into what I have noticed in the wake, especially much of the awakening and revival that God seems to be doing, is we'll slide into using God for something. Or I have my project, I have my pet issue, I have my agenda, I have my things I'm accomplishing, and I'm really just wanting to ride the hashtags as best as I can to get my attention or my 15 minutes or my, my thing to be known. And I remember just even in the couple weeks following Asbury and even among our students as we were gathering, hearing the echoes of voices that we had locally and even some that were coming online and hearing the chorus of people Speaking of the reality of like, well, it's, it can't be a true awakening if there isn't social change, you know. And so unless they, unless they mention my justice project of choice or climate change or unless they deal with poverty, then it's not real, true awakening of God. Or this moment is just too emotional or it's not liturgical enough or they're not preaching the word enough or the gospel isn't clear enough or there's just all kinds of ways that we all have our own things that people have inserted into this moment to say, unless it's done the way I say it should be done, then it's clearly not a valid thing. And it just reminds me of this moment in which we're in where we have all these issues swirling about, some of which we've all like had our own agenda about how we desire to solve it. We have these grand issues, and then we say the moment where God pours out his presence, well, unless there's no radical social change or movement or justice that comes with it, it's, it's not worth it. No change, like, give it a minute. The kingdom of God does not come as a weed that sprouts up overnight. It's an acorn that gets planted in the soil and its roots go deep, very deep, and they wrap around the rocks. And when they sprout, they're very small and they grow very slow. But make no mistake, it grows strong. And when it bears fruit, that bears fruit for eternity. And that, my friends, is not something you will measure in a tick-tock time span. But 30 or 40 years from now, you watch how you hear the testimonies of those Young men and women who are being touched now, who are being marked by God, experiencing the presence of God, whose lives were never the same. And you watch the lives that they live over the coming decades, my friend. No change. Would you give it a minute? 
And could we also just step and acknowledge for a moment, my kids all come home from school and I hear some of the stories they tell to me about the things that they're learning and I love how they're becoming aware of injustice and aware of all the change, like uh, all the issues going on in the world. But can, can we also just say when we turn 11 year olds into activists and give them issues vastly more complicated than their brains can comprehend and give them nothing more than their own voice and self-sufficiency as the answer to it all? Do you think they might be a little anxious about that? I believe deep in my soul, and I'm experiencing it more and more in Jesus, that his presence is the thing that we were made for. It's his presence that actually comes and brings the necessary filling to the void, the anxious void that we carry in our hearts. And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at the life of Jesus specifically. And I want to look at him and watch because he walked in our skin and he walked in our world and he knows the struggles, the temptations, the trials, the challenges. He knows all of the... I wanted to cuss there for a moment. He knows all of the crud. (laughs) He knows all of the stuff that we face. And yet, he was so resilient in his faithfulness to his father. He was so intimate in his relationship with him. His... His obedience to God never became about a functional religion where I do this in order to get that. He loved and trusted his father to such a degree that he could actually say that he and I are one. And there's a moment in Jesus' life that highlights this in an incredible way when he's being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And what you see Jesus is refuse to just simply desire God for something or to use God for something, but to truly trust God in the most beautiful and purest sense where he loves and trusts his Father because his Father is totally faithful. And I think there's something not just for us to be able to appreciate and adore as we watch Jesus walk through that moment. But I think there's something to realize that the same spirit of God that filled Jesus now fills his people. That you and I can have that same resilience. You and I can have that same peace. And you and I can have that level of faith and trust in our Father as we walk through all the ways that the world tries to bend us and pull us away from him. So that being said... Let's go to Mark chapter 1. We're going to go to Mark 1 for just a moment and then be in Matthew chapter 4 if you've got a Bible and want to earmark those couple spots. We're going to start first with Jesus' baptism, which will lead into his trial, his, his testing in the wilderness. Starting in verse 9, it says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. But just as he was coming up from the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son. Whom I love, with you I'm well pleased. Now, these are really profound things that the Father is directly with his voice speaking to his Son, but they're not just some verbal affirmation or affection that he's doting out on him, even though he is doing that. There's more to that. These are three direct quotations from Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah that was to come and save the world. You are my son. This is from Psalm 2, which is about a conquering king that would come and root out all evil and and injustice in the world. Whom I love. This is Genesis 22, the story of Isaac and Abraham, a cooperative son cooperating in his own sacrifice, a lamb-like sacrifice, together with his father. And then with whom I am well pleased comes from Isaiah 42, which describes a suffering servant that is so obedient to God and yet is so rejected by the ones he's called to serve that he ends up dying as a result of it, but somehow mysteriously, after some short period of time, becomes undead. And this is God's way from Psalm 2, Genesis 22, Isaiah 42, though we could have pulled hundreds of other examples to say, this is him. This is the one that all of the Bible has been written about and building the expectation for. This is him. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And at once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angel attended him. Now, Mark doesn't give us any details about what happened in the wilderness, but thankfully, Matthew does. So let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, 
he was hungry, which is like the greatest no-dust statement ever in the Bible. It takes no logical intellectual abilities. What happens after 40 days of not eating? You're very hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And so it begins. This is the epic moment in all of cosmic history where good versus evil, God versus Satan is happening in this moment. This is the conflict that all of the Bible has been leading up to. And this is a moment of incredible significance. And it's easy to read past this moment and realize, okay, Jesus was really hungry. The devil's testing him to make bread for himself. And that's just all that's really going on. And then not see the layers of just nuance and tactics and schemes being used by the devil here that are used against us all of the time that we're so used to and almost numb to that we blindly fall into them without thinking twice. But let's just unpack what's going on here. Notice the first words that come out of the devil's mouth, which were, if you are the son of God. Now Jesus in this moment, like being tested by the devil, is a parallel passage of what happened to the first humans in Genesis chapter 3. Jesus is reliving the human story, except winning everywhere that we failed. He's renewing the human story and living faithfully to his Father rather than submitting into the whims of and lies of, particularly, the devil. And what you'll notice when you look back at Genesis 3 is that the devil's tactics haven't exactly changed over the years. He's quite intelligent, but he's not that creative. And so the first words that the devil brought to the early humans were, did God really say you are not allowed to eat from the trees in the garden? Did God really say were the first words out of the devil's mouth in Genesis 3, and then the first words out of his mouth in Matthew 4 are, if you are the son of God. But if you remember back to his baptism, what were the last words that Jesus just heard from his father's mouth? You are my son. Did God really say you're his son? Let's see. And think about the way in which the devil wants to tempt Jesus. It doesn't seem that sadistic, does it? Make bread. Why? You're hungry. That's why. Now let's just notice that for a moment. Jesus prepares himself for the greatest cosmic battle in all universal history by doing my favorite spiritual discipline and yours, fasting why would you prepare yourself for the greatest battle of the universe by fasting well let's compare it to how you prepare yourself for your greatest test challenges battles that you face if you remember if you are in school or you were back in school you remember what you did to prepare for your final exams other than cramming last minute but it was Red Bull, it was caffeine, it was doing everything you're good, to put all that information in, you were sleeping with books on your face, hoping that osmosis was a thing, <laughs> like, even though there's no chance it's a thing. And you were doing everything you could to strengthen your mind as much as possible, to be as great as you could for that moment. Just like Pastor Brian, I also played college football. That's why we're like this weird mixture. I was a receiver, he was a DB, so there's just this, this weird, it's like yin and yang to our whole, so oil and water sort to our relationship, you know, that's why. Like natural born enemies to a degree, you know. <laughs> but in football, it was the right nutrition, the right amount of rest. You had to be at peak performance whenever you came into a level of actual challenge. Think about all of your many members of your community outrunning the marathon of the Flying Pig Marathon happening today. God bless all the people that pay for the privilege of running on public roads. <laughs> so hard for me not to make fun of them. I hate running. I really hate running. You say, but Pastor said, didn't you say you just play football? Don't you run a lot in football? Yeah, from scary people that want to hurt you. <laughs> like, that's, that's different. It's totally different. There's a motive there. It's not just for fun. In the rain. And let me pay you. Can I pay you more? <laughs> Sorry. That's mean. But I assume they're not here because they're probably resting at this point. They're running. They're living their best life. That's good for them. We like them. We just don't want to be like them. That's just all I'm saying. Uh, But everything has to be fine-tuned to maximize your peak performance. Okay, Jesus has the same mindset, but how does he think? How do I maximize my strength in this moment? I empty myself of all my strength. 
I better make sure there's not a single shred of my own strength in operation. You know when it says that when we are weak, we are very strong? Some of you are like, yes, I'm feeling that. It's encouragement. That's nice. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's a cliche that just ministers to me. (laughs) Do we like it? Yes. Do we believe it? I'm not sure. But Jesus did. He did. After 40 days of fasting, the man is emptied of every level of natural strength in himself so that all that's about to happen between him and the devil is a product of the power of the Spirit and the Father inside of him. He prepares differently than you. Please take note of that. And when he is starving, which is what fast, can we just be honest about fasting for a moment? It's starving. It's slowly killing yourself, actually. So what do you do when you're starving and you're dying rapidly? Well, the first thing the devil offers is bread. So let's just take stock of this for a moment, shall we? Imagine you're the devil. Don't do that often, but just for, you know. (laughs) The devil is just simply uh, coming into this moment. You and me are here to do battle, but uh, it doesn't need to go that way doesn't need to go that way at all. Your father sent you here to battle me, but I'm not here to battle you. In fact, here's how this can go. You are here starving and dying. In fact, your father sent you here to die, but I'm offering you bread, which gives life. You say you're really God's son and that he loves you? He loves you. He loves you, but he's killing you. You're starving for him right now. But keep in mind, who do you think really has your best interest in mind? I'm offering you life, bread. This is why you fall to sin so easily. Not because the devil is so scary and evil and mean and your adversary and your enemy. Because he will come as your best friend. And when you have a problem, he'll have a solution. And you know what his solutions are called? sin. And it's why you love it. You know there's only one reason why you sin, by the way? You like it. And it's solving something. And the devil is happy to offer you a solution other than God to meet your real needs. Which is why most of our lives are looking for all the right things and all the wrong places. But Jesus doesn't do that. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus' reply, it is written. Did God really say you're his son? Well, okay. The last thing I heard my father say was that I am his son. I trust what my father says about me, so I don't need to receive your version of life. Even if it means the cost of my life, I trust my father ultimately for his vision of life. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I'm feeding on things you don't even know about. The words my father speaks to me, that is my food. That is what sustains me. That is my life. There's nothing you can give to me to replace that life. In fact, even if it looks like death on the outside, it is life on the inside. Next. (laughs) To which he takes him up to a really high point. and says, okay, let's try this again. You say you trust your father, huh? You must really trust your father. Well, why don't you throw yourself down off of this high point? Because isn't it also written that he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone? Hey, I can play this game too. I know what the Bible says. Isn't it true that your father won't let anything bad happen to you before the appointed time? So if you say you trust him so much, are you sure you can trust him? Are you absolutely sure you can trust him? Because if you're not 100% sure you can trust him, you know what you should do now? Test him. Because by the time he gets to the cross, it's too late. It's too late. If you're not 100% certain that three days after the cross you're rising, here's your chance to test whether God's faithful to his word. Jump and see if he catches you which is a much more subtle and nuanced test to 
to act stupid in order to see if God will be faithful. Your stupidity is not required in order to know the reliability of God. Acting like a fool is not advancing your faith. Well, maybe if I just sin a little bit more, then I taste more of God's grace. Jesus doesn't just trust his Father. He trusts his Father completely. And he doesn't need to test the waters. His life is totally in his hands. And then lastly, here's the grand finale. The devil says, okay, this strategy is clearly not working great. Let's try a third way. Uh, okay, let's level. Let's level. You and me, Jesus, let's level here. I know why you're here. You know why you're here. We know why you're here. You're here to get the kingdoms of the world back because I stole them from you. I took them from you. I think I was saving them from you because your father's really oppressive. He put them in a garden and put restrictions around it. I think this is an oppressive God, not a blessing God. And so I was actually helping them. But you're here to get them back. I get it. Here's the deal. Your father sent you here to get them back by dying for them on a cross. I'll give them back to you. And here's the best part. You don't have to die. Once again, once again, Jesus, here's the recurring theme of this whole time together. Your father says he loves you, yet he insists on your death and suffering. He insists on it. And you go along with it? Why exactly? I'm here saying I'm offering you bread. I'm offering you an opportunity at certainty. I'm offering you an opportunity at escaping inevitable death and you can achieve the same outcome you want purpose you want meaning you want calling i'll give it to you and you won't have to die for it all you have to do is worship me but hey hey, hey that might seem like a steep price but who loves you more he's trying to kill you i'm trying to save you i'm trying to save you can't tell you how many times it's come up again and again in my soul that following Jesus feels like death. I remember in my early 20s and I remember thinking, oh Jesus your sexual standards are pretty high. I'm a young man and they just feel pretty impossible. And I hear it all today. Somehow it's, it would be death to live pure or to be celibate. Because it sure feels like it, doesn't it? Can we be honest in church? It sure feels like it. There's desires, there's needs, and yet God says no or not yet. It feels like, ooh, I don't know what I'm going to do to satisfy that in the meantime. The devil says, you don't have to wait. Or you don't have to accept the boundary. You can have what you want when you want it. My early 20s, I remember really struggling, particularly with lust. And uh, I know I'm the only uh, 20-year-old male that had some sexual temptations in his life. But just hear my story, and hopefully it encourages you in some irrelevant way. I remember just being so frustrated. On February 18th of 2000, I gave my life to Jesus. I got born again, filled with the Spirit, and I have never felt better. It's amazing. Forgiven of my sin, I felt lighter walking out the doors. It was incredible. February 19th of 2000, I found that though my heart had changed and I loved God, I genuinely loved God, many of my behavioral patterns had not. And temptation didn't quit. And after several years of accountability groups and software filters and like all of the things, I was just sick and tired of always being that guy in the group that had to go first and share about the thing that he did wrong and then get prayed for and repent over and over and over and over and over to eventually I wouldn't confess every week. I'd wait for like two or three weeks to at least let it build up a little bit, you know what I mean? Because it was just, at some point I'm getting a punch card here because this frequent flyer program is not, 
It's not working for me. And I remember, I remember at one particular moment where I had fallen again, and I was, I was at the end of my rope, or at least I thought I was, and I was so frustrated. I was sad mad. I was, ever been sad mad before? It's like tears, but clenched teeth, really sad mad, so frustrated. And I remember crying out to God, why won't this stop? And I remember hearing from my father, because you won't let it. I said, no, 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 that is not true. That is not true. You see me sad mad? You see me sad mad right now? This is me wanting it to stop. And anytime you have an argument with God, it's just, I'm, I take nothing but L's. I'm still zero for everything in my arguments with him. And then I remember him showing me, and it's difficult to articulate like what this looked or felt like. So just, because it was all happening between me and God internally, but let me just try to explain it the best that I can. What God showed me, he revealed to me what lust was, or better to say, who lust was. Um, and I didn't see it, uh, but I felt it. And I felt the presence, the personal presence of lust with me. And at that moment, I had an immediate emotional sort of gut reaction to his presence, being aware of his presence. And do you know what that gut feeling was like? I'll give you a hint. It was not disgust or anger. You know that feeling you get when you see a childhood friend you haven't seen in years, but you pick up right where you left off? You know, the one you used to build forts with, you know, and, uh, and have pillow fights with and share your secrets to and, like, play football on the street with, you know what I mean? That's how I felt. It was one of the sickest feelings. Well, this has been a childhood friend. Whenever I was lonely, he was there. Whenever I felt like my desires for intimacy or affection were never going to be possible, he always had a solution for me. Whenever I felt overwhelmed or stressed out, he always had a distraction for me. He was always there for me. He was always helping me find life in my darkest moments. And then you realize he was the friend you only thought was a friend that was betraying you the whole time, only trying to lead you to death. And it sickened me. And what the Father led me to do was not just repent of a behavior, but break up with a friendship. And it felt like it. It felt like looking my childhood best friend in the face and saying, we're not friends anymore, I am your enemy. It felt like that. And I remember, oh, well, this is different. And and it has, and it was, and it was. Because I fundamentally exchanged who I believed was the source of life. And I trust that God, whatever your way is, even if it feels like death, I trust it'll lead me to life. If you say to deny myself and take up my cross, I'll follow you. The devil says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. I'll give you the very thing you were sent here to do. I'll fulfill your purpose for you. All you need to do is worship me. And Jesus said, away from me. I worship my father alone. Because everything in us wants to take the easiest route to life. But Jesus knew that true life, true life, abundant life, comes through God not any other shortcut. And so we're left at the end of the story trying to reel with it and wrestle with it and realizing it hits our life in all kinds of ways. All the lies you believe, all the sins you entertain are all just simply friendship that you have with the devil ongoing, directly denying any of God's faithfulness or trusting him for anything. And you're left in this moment, well, how do I, like, how do I know, how do I know that I can trust Jesus? If I'm going to live a life of sacrifice, if I'm going to give up living my best life now because I'm going to follow him instead, if I'm going to instead, instead of like seeking my most authentic identity internally and expressing it externally, if instead I'm going to receive an identity from him that he speaks over me that may even contradict how I feel about myself, if I'm going to do that, that's going to feel like death. That's going to feel like suffering. That's going to feel like I am denying myself in the deepest core of who I am. Uh Uh-huh. How do I know that Jesus is good to his word? How do I know that he truly is the one who gives life and life more abundant? How do I know? Friends, all that I can tell you is this, that a greater love has never been shown anywhere in the universe than this, that the Son of God died for his enemies on the cross. You trust who loves you most, 
you trust most, who loves you most, and there's no one that's loved you more. There's no one that has not only walked in his faithful trust of his Father, but demonstrated that God knows the way out of the grave. He knows the way out of your sin. He knows the way to overcome your deepest fears. He knows the way to conquer the lies. And it's through trusting in Jesus. It's through trusting in him. It's through giving our lives to him. Not trying harder, but trusting him. Knowing that his way brings life. Every other way of the enemy, it just brings a perverted, a counterfeit version of life that satisfies for now, but it's killing you. Like chapped lips, you thinking that the more you look, or the more you lick, the better it will be. Only getting worse and worse and worse and worse. But it's time to stop falling for the one that pretends to be our friend while he stabs us in the back. It's time to stop falling for the lies and trusting in the one who will not give you every answer to your question. He won't give you immediate emotional peace and all your depression. He won't give you every dollar you need that you feel like needs to come in by tomorrow. He's not going to give you everything you think you need right now, but he's going to give you himself. Himself. He offers you himself. The one thing that Jesus in the wilderness, starving with nothing, was insistent. My father is enough. I'm not leaving him. He's enough. He's enough. And my father delights. He delights not just to give me some things, but all things. But I desire most him for him. Not what he gives. I don't want to use him. I want to trust him. Jesus lived this life in our human skin that we were supposed to live though failed in a victorious way so that you and I might live in him in the same trust of his father so that you and I can find life not death, life life and life eternal so let's just take a moment Where are you settling for the lies and the temporary solutions that have you stuck? Where have you subtly exchanged, maybe in your heart, of desiring God for God, and now God being a vending machine that you just need the latest need met from? And will we afresh give our hearts to him, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him. Trust him that he is the way to true life. Settle in our hearts today. Who are we going to trust in the issue of life and death? Who are you going to trust in the issue of life and death? Because it's always going to be about an issue of life and death. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking that you would come now through the Son and by the Spirit and that you would minister to our hearts. For all of us that have just settled for all the quick fixes of sin, the temporary pleasures of sin, for those of us that feel stuck in patterns of sin because it's meeting real needs in our life, Father, I'm asking that you would draw us into the truth that life is only found in you. And Father, I'm asking that you would recapture our hearts afresh. Draw close to us. Take our loves and purify them. That you would once again revive our first love for you. Father, I'm asking that you would touch every fear and every anxiety in this room because you say that perfect love casts out fear. So come. Come. Come now. Come be with us. Come fill us. Come satisfy us in the way that only you can. here this morning, whether you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or you're just saying, I need to return my heart to Jesus. 
just going to invite you to stand to your feet as we close out the service. I know it's a bold move, but Jesus did a bold thing for you. It's a small thing to do for him. Stand and say, Father, I want to return to you. Jesus, I want you to be Lord of me. I let go of who I say I am. I let go of what I think I need. I let go of my plans for my life. And I trust once again in you. Not just what you give, but you. Not just what you do, but you. I trust in you. Just from your own heart, out of your own mouth, you can confess Jesus is Lord. Trust that God raised him from the dead. And just declare to him what you want. Tell him that you want him. Tell him that you want to draw near to him. Tell him that you want to trust him. Tell him that you need his help to trust him. Tell him that you're turning from your sin. Tell him that you're breaking up with the devil. Tell him that you're breaking up with lust. That you're breaking up with greed. That you're breaking up with jealousy. And you're trusting him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Revive us, O oh God. Revive us, O oh God. 